All right. Hi, my name is Rance McCall. Uh, I did a clinical study uh, using the functional movement screens, and, and I looked at a correlation between prior injury history, reported pain levels, and deep overhead squat scores in a high school male population. All right, so before we get started, I just want to show you guys two numbers. First, this one, 1 1.16 million. That's the number of high school students who sustained a high school sports-related injury during the 2016 to 2017 school year. And then 40%. That's a percentage of those injuries that are related to the lower limb. So why is this happening? Well, one common cause is poor kinematics. And what are kinematics? Well, in medical terms, kinematics are the independent motion of joints or body segments. It is how your body is able to move on its own without assistance, without the added burden of weight, is how your body is able to move independently of other factors. And so how do you measure uh, kinematics? Well, a lot of uh, prominent athletic trainers around the country will use some, a tool called the functional movement screen, which clinically assesses dysfun dysfunctional and asymmetric movement patterns in athletes. And through prior studies, it has been found to be a consistent yet weak indicator of injury, sus of injury susceptibility. And in these prior studies, uh, several conclusions have been made about the FMS test. So first, uh, correlation with healthy lifestyles and high scores. That was a uh, conclusion found by a study by Davis et al. Um, that just means that in their study, what they did was they looked at a bunch of people in the military, uh, and they compared those who smoked versus those who did not smoke. And uh, people who did use tobacco products tend to have uh, worse scores on the FMS test than people who did not use tobacco products. Uh, second, uh, in Heredia et al, they found that uh, higher scores indicate uh, higher quality kinematics. Basically what that means is they had a bunch of uh, about middle-aged adults um, who were largely sedentary. They uh, made them all do a um, the deep overhead squat portion of the functional movement screen, and they found that adults who scored a three Tended to, do, tended to have much higher overall quality kinematics throughout their body than those who scored a one or a two. Uh, and then finally, Arslan and Nepali found that there was no established relationship between injury history and FMS scores. Um, to do that, they looked at a bunch of elite uh, male soccer players in Turkey, and they had all of them do a FMS test, and they asked them if they had sustained a major injury, uh, largely to their knee, so a, for example, an ACL tear. And what they found was that uh, if they had injured their knee, or if they had not injured their knee, it really didn't matter uh, as to their likelihood of scoring a one, two, or a three. Uh, and so for my study, I uh, my study was largely inspired from the Heredia et al. study, in which I just gave participants a base questionnaire to get background information about them. And then I had them perform a functional movement screen deep overhead squat, and then I recorded their results. And my, so my study um, used the clinical study method, which basically just means I used human volunteers uh, to conduct a study that had, was for a medical purpose. And in my study, I found, uh, I just asked the demographics of all my uh, participants. So I asked for their age, uh, their year in high school, and their athletic participation. Gender doesn't matter because um, in my study I only assessed males. Um, and then I asked for their injury histories and um, I just asked them if they had or had not had an injury to their ankle, knee, hip, or lower back. And then I asked for their self-reported pain levels um, on a scale of zero to five, how much pain they're feeling in each of those areas, their ankle, knee, hip, or lower back. Uh, and then I had each of them do a deep overhead squat according to the FMS uh, guidelines. Um, and then I just recorded their results. And if they did not score a three, which is a perfect score, then I just noted which dysfunctions that they had. And here are my results. So these are the uh, general participants that I had. Um, I had uh, freshmen uh, just the four years at my high school, um, about a quarter were freshmen, about a third were juniors, uh, only 10% were seniors, and then a little over a third were sophomores. Um, the highest level of participant 
highest level of athletics that they had participated in at high school level. About half participated in varsity sports. Um, all the dysfunctions that were identified by, uh, that I identified. So, I, the, the dysfunctions that I identified were hands interior, so hands too far forward, uh, limited dorsiflexion, which is the movement of your ankle, um, and then several others regarding your back, your leg movement, things like that. Uh, I also looked at their deep squat scores, so what scores they received on it. Uh, most people received a two, about 70%. Uh, and then self-reported pain levels. So for every participant, I asked them uh, to rate what amount of pain they're feeling in each of those four areas from a scale of zero to five, uh, with zero being no pain at all, one being just a little bit of pain, and five being a tremendous amount of pain. Um, and for ankle pain in every other area, it, the graph largely looked like this, where the majority of participants said a zero, I'm, not, I'm fine, I'm not feeling any pain at all. A few saying that they have a little bit of pain, and then very few saying that they have a tremendous amount. Uh, same thing here with knee pain, majority of participants hit zero, and then it gradually goes down. Hip pain, and then lower back pain was really interesting because only half of participants said that uh, they felt zero pain. Whereas, and there were much more people who did feel a significant or a tremendous amount of pain in that three, four, five range scale. Uh, and then I asked for their injury history. This was just a simple yes, no question. Um, in all these uh, results, I largely found that it was pretty much a good 50-50 split, um, give or take just a little bit between yes or a no. Uh, with ankle, with knee, it was about uh, one third to two third. Uh, hip, about uh, three quarters to one quarter. Uh, with red being no, they had never sustained an injury, and blue being yes, they had sustained an injury. Uh, and then lower back was about that three fourth to one fourth ratio. Uh, and then moving on to, to the discussion, what were the main takeaways from, this, from these results? Well, first off, these scores were unsatisfactory. They weren't very good. Nearly 70% of participants scored a two on the FMS test. And two times as many participants scored a one and a three. About 20% scored a one and about 10% scored a three. And this is really problematic because the normal score is supposed to be a three. And that means only one in 10 participants actually had proper kinematic movement that is expected. Um, and this is especially concerning because of the high level of athletic participation among my research population. 85% uh, of participants reported to participate in high school athletics. And this is a problem because poor kinematics, as assessed by their poor performance on the FMS test, may have an increased injury risk. Uh, second, there was one quirk of the FMS test that I kind of noticed throughout my study. Uh, there was a relationship between the hands anterior dysfunction and the limited dorsiflexion dysfunction that I don't really think should have been there. Um, so there was a really high correlation between the hands anterior and then the limited dorsiflexion dysfunctions. Those would have to do with your uh, shoulder and your ankle. Um, but the problem with that is your shoulder and your ankle, they're nowhere near each other on the human body. Uh, and despite that, there were 31 participants who had the limited dorsiflexion uh, dysfunction and then there were 28 participants who had the hands anterior dysfunction. And so I think that this could be a possible flaw within the scoring system of the functional movement screen. Because if a, let's just think this through, if a participant has limited dorsiflexion, then he would have to extend his hands forward in order to prevent from falling over. And so even though he doesn't necessarily have two dysfunctions, his shoulder may be perfectly fine, it's just his ankle that has limited dorsiflexion, he's still penalized for having two dysfunctions, even though he's only feeling his one. And I think that that is a good suggestion for further research to see if that is a quirk in the scoring system that needs to be accounted for. Uh, and then finally, reported pain levels in prior injury history relationship. Uh, just like in the study uh, that I mentioned earlier by Arslan and Nicole, uh, I have found no correlation between reported pain levels and prior injury history. Um, the injury history, it really has no effect on current pain levels. Uh, just to visualize what I'm talking about here, here is a percent of participants who said that they had a, um, that indicated that they had an injury history with each of these four areas of the body. And then here's a percentage of the uh, people who had reported pain in those areas of the body. 
And none of these uh, percentages really line up that well. The closest gap between the two is about 11 percentage points. Um, and I think that this can be attributed to the wonders of modern medicine, where uh, things like reconstructive surgery and other uh, healing techniques allow injuries to rehabilitate uh, quickly and efficiently back to their original state. Um, and they have no lingering effects on each uh, patient. Uh, and then let's talk about some limitations of my research. So the first one was just my research population. I only studied high school males at an all boys prep school. So what this means is that um, while my uh, results are applicable to people falling in that very specific category, they really aren't for other populations, such as women, geriatric populations, etc. Uh, the class of 23 uh, were seniors in my case. Um, that was an underrepresented population. Uh, only about 10% instead of the expected 25% because of the four classes, so we'd expect them to be divided equally, but they were uh, fortunately underrepresented. underrepresented. And then finally, just researcher inexperience. Uh, this is my first time uh, administering FMS on a large scale like this, and so naturally I would be more susceptible to errors than a trained athletic uh, trainer would be. Um, but to kind of minimize this effect, I did use guidelines from our school's athletic trainer uh, who has over 30 years of experience uh, in this field. Uh, and then several implications of my research. So, I think that there was a severe lack of functional movement patterns. Uh, and this is very prevalent because only 10.7% of participants scored a three, which again is supposed to be the normal result for this test. Uh, this means that nine in 10 participants had kinematic dysfunctions at some level, uh, indicating a greater injury risk. And this is concerning because 85.7% of participants did participate in FLX. Um, so that means that all those people who participate in athletics who are unable to score a, a three, which is a lot of people in this study, are, have a high injury susceptibility. And some conclusions here. So first, low FMS scores relate to increased uh, risk of injury. If that's the only takeaway then, uh, from this, then that's what it should be. Uh, this is why low FMS scores are problematic, because they increase uh, an athlete's risk of injury so that that you may sustain while participating in the sport. Um, and for this reason, I've come to, with, uh, to the suggestion that I think the FMS test should be mandatory for participation in high school athletics. Uh, if athletes cannot score at least a two, indicating that they cannot uh, show functional movement with, uh, with assistance uh, in the form of a, a platform underneath their heels, uh, I don't think that they should be allowed to be on the field. Um, because we need to reduce injury rates in high school sports. Thank you very much. Terrific, thanks Ransom. I got a few questions for you and then it will be done. Okay. Uh, so for the first one, how did you determine uh, which results that were generated by your method were the most important for your conclusion? Um, well, I, re I was really going for a certain few number. I. The re so I minimized the amount of results that I was really looking for. Uh, really the only things that I tested for were uh, injury history and, um, and uh, current pain levels. And so since those were really the only two things that I tested for, those were the two most important things for my results section. Okay. And then as a follow-up to that, uh, what are the real-world implications or consequences related to your findings? Oh, yeah. So the real-world implications of this is that a lot – My so my study only assessed 58 high school males. Uh, but if that's indicative at all of the uh, greater population, that means that the majority of people have dysfunctions in their uh, kinematic movement, especially in the deep overhead squat. And that's extremely problematic, especially for people in high school. Like I mentioned earlier, with that 1.16 million uh, injuries sustained during the 2016-2017 school year, um, there's a significant amount of people who have dysfunctions in their kinematic movement. And that's problematic because that puts them at a higher risk of injury, of sustaining the injury. And so what this means is that we need 
we would need to have more people score three in order to get that number down to increase uh, to decrease risk of uh, injury for high school athletic athletes. Terrific. And then the final question: If you could revisit your research project process now, like maybe even go back to change something, yeah. what would it be, and why would you do it differently? Um, I would really want to control for diet uh, diet analysis. I'd be really curious. To, so. Uh, when I was doing the uh, research for this project at the very beginning, uh, there was one study that I came across that I thought was really interesting. It had to do with uh, Spanish children um, and their um, and their functional movement. But the reason why I didn't uh, do it was because it focused more on body composition instead of kinematics. But I'd still be really curious to investigate that because um, what it found was that body composition, and which is uh, that just means body fat percentage. Um, it's largely a result of um, what you eat. You know, like if you eat really well, then you would have a better composition than if you don't eat really well. And what they found was that if you have a high body fat percentage, then you're less likely to do well on the functional movement screen. And if you had a lower body fat percentage, you'd be more likely to do good on it. And so I'd be really curious if I tested for that, what I would find. I'd probably find something similar, um, but I would just want to test for diet and then look at uh, body fat.